Hello, Kubernetes community. Welcome back to OpenShift Commons. I'm Chris Short, Principal Technical Marketing Manager at Red Hat and Cloud Native Computing Ambassador. I'm honored to be your host today. Today we're joined by someone who I look up to as a guide for how to act with dignity and respect. Also, I have sought out career advice from our guests today, and so far they haven't steered me wrong, so thank you for that. I'm happy to be joined by the one and only staff developer advocate at Google, Kelsey Hightower. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm happy to be here, but I'm even more happy that I didn't steer you in the wrong direction with your career <laughs> because that would be bad. Well, uh, you're here, so I mean, that's a good indication, right? And yes. Tell the audience about you, uh, what you do at Google, what you do for the broader tech community as a whole kind of deal. I like to keep it short. I'm a technologist at heart. So okay. I have various HR titles. Uh, you know, I've done really well at Google, love working with the technologies. And when you think about Kelsey, the whole person, there's this minimalist behind the keyboard. There's this vegetarian. There's this person who really believes a lot in financial independence. And I really like like meeting new people and helping them be a better person and hoping that they help me do the same. So uh, that's that's wonderful. That's that's good advice, I think, for everyone in this industry. So that's why I often listen to Kelsey. So you do a lot of work uh, to actually help others in the community, and you put it out there for everyone to use. And I think one of the larger pieces of work I discovered early on was uh, Kubernetes the hard way. And yeah, that's the hard way, all right. What inspires you to build and maintain things like that? Because you also have another great project called No Code, which has tens of thousands of stars on <laughs> GitHub too. Yeah, it's, it's funny, the, the No Code GitHub repository has 3x more stars, and we're talking like 30,000 stars on that repository. And there's literally nothing there. No. Versus one that takes me like hours to maintain and keep updated. Yeah. That every in every some quarter. Cases, yeah, every quarter, every time there's a new <laughs> Kubernetes release, I have to go reevaluate the guide. Ooh. But the premise behind Kubernetes the hard way was really trying to do my part to return the favor to all the other people who've written blog posts and books. I consider myself self-taught, self-taught mm -hmm. programming, self-taught system administrator. And even though we use self-taught to get started, it's the people we work with, the people throughout our careers that help us be better. And along the way, you have an opportunity to share what you know. And I do that through various mechanisms, whether that's a keynote stage or podcasts like this one. But Kubernetes the hard way is where I said, let me just sit down and try to take everything that I know about Kubernetes and put it in a guide that's so tedious. I mean, so laborious that when you're finished, mm. you feel like you accomplished something. And in truth, that that level of education that you get through that guide, I think will live with you forever. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, if I have a problem with a core Kubernetes thing, I usually go to look at that guide and like, how would it be set up? What, how is this different kind of thing? Um, that is always very helpful. But the the, I think, you know, you mentioned uh, in your intro that like giving back and then receiving back, right? Like, I'm sure when you sat down and created it for the first time on that, you know, whatever the first version was of Kubernetes, there's a lot of missing pieces from your brain that were missing from that repository as well, like. Did you see a lot of people immediately giving back or did it take some time? I mean, what was that like for you? I love the way you phrase that, like giving back, because what people tend to do in open source <laughs> is they'll open these issues and be like, what the hell are you talking about? Mm. That's not how you do that part. But for the majority, I would say, the far majority, there are people saying, hey, I understand that this is just a tutorial, but you could really tighten up security here. Instead of right. using one SSL certificate for all the components, how about you generate one certificate per component so we can show people that's not necessarily the best practice, even though it could lead in that direction, but security is a big trade-off so that they can learn to value all the hard work that goes into the tools that try to do the right thing. Yeah, that is a weird, like, as a teaching instrument, uh, I know that over the years, like, various, uh, you know, I consider myself self-taught, too, but over the years I've taken, like, you know, certain courses, like, certification classes and stuff like that, and it's always interesting to me to find that very thin line between teaching people the right amount of security so they don't hurt themselves or, you know, whatever they're building versus teaching them how to actually use the product, and, like, there's that, or project, there's that 
problem nowadays where they're kind of both just as important. Yeah, How, I learned a yeah, lot yeah. Go about talk. Kubernetes writing that guide, right? So as right. I'm writing this guide, I often had to ask myself a question. Is this still the best way to do this piece? Hmm. Ma yeah. Maybe something's changed since I've learned it. Right. I, I often find that problem with like Ansible as a project that I've worked on and extensively, right? Like from version to version, it is uh, different. And I just discovered some old, I, def I found an old Raspberry Pi in my house uh, yesterday that had been running for 400 days and there had been automation for it and everything. And I could have been running it, but I had forgotten about it for 400 days um, at least. So, yeah, like going back and having to figure out, right, why did I do that? Why did I do this? Is there something new in Ansible that could help me with this? That's going to be challenging. And it would be like, you know, going back two years in time and knowing that amount of Kubernetes and then stepping forward now uh, to, you know, 117 today and saying, okay, where do I, you know, fix what and where kind of deal. So, yeah, it's it's got to be challenging to maintain not just the continuous skill set, but the continuous learning. Um, like, how do you yeah. keep up and to people, date with all this stuff? <laughs> well, people will help you, right? So a, a big part of learning, part of the learning process is putting out there what you already know and allowing people to kind of nitpick at it, maybe highlight areas where you have gaps. And a lot of times their feedback will help you fill those gaps or point you into a direction, right? For example, on Kubernetes the hard way, people may get to the networking component and say, I don't really understand this whole, like how are you making networking work without having Weave or Calico in the mm -hmm. mix? Yeah. And then what I have to do is like remind myself, okay, L3 networking, how do I get this down into one and two sentences <laughs> where I could you know, maybe answer the question for this person. But then it also says, wow, yeah, I am not answering that question in this guide. Maybe I should, or there are some cases where I say, man, I can't answer this question. Let me go do some research to figure out why this is actually working, right? I know how it works in concept, but I need to really get a concrete answer here. And this is how I just kind of stay on top of things. And I just love to keep tinkering. Mm. Yeah, you do have to kind of be a, 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 not a glutton for punishment, but like one that likes to like to turn every screw and adjust every, you know, bolt to see what it does kind of deal. Um, you know, did you, you know, were you one of those kids that grew up and like took things apart and put them back together? I mean, was that the Kelsey Hightower of, of old, olden day? <laughs> Just out of curiosity. No, if, you, if, you, if you knew the old Kelsey Hightower, right? The, 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 the guy growing up through middle school. I mean, I, I would consider myself a cool person. I, you know, I cared about how I dressed and I played sports. I played three sports. Hmm. Uh, I was more into athletics and just like the social aspects of life. And I really enjoyed that part of my life. I didn't touch really a computer until like the 10th grade. Oh, wow. I, I didn't even think about any of this stuff. So I would probably say, yeah, I probably would help put together some furniture here and there. <laughs> I probably cared about video games like Nintendo was my thing. I can remember oh, yeah. playing Tetroid without any help, right? Without a Game Pro magazine. So I'm showing my age here, Game Pro magazines. <laughs> Right. That they was cool would, stuff when I was a kid, so you're not showing your age that badly. I mean, come on. Right, you remember, like, Game <laughs> yeah. Pro, you would get an uh, article, and you would look at it, and you could actually fold out mm -hmm. the various levels, and it would show you the whole world yeah. about how you go. And I remember just playing Metroid, and I was like, you know what? I'm not going to use any of those. I just want to explore the entire space. Wow. And I think that thought process, that willingness to kind of complete something, mm. is what I find very useful in tech today. Yeah, that would be super useful, especially like uh, at that you know scale, right? Like putting a guide together is uh, or, or versus you know uh, what eight bit or sixteen bit video game completing that. I feel like is similar levels of effort, especially if that video game is having a new series in its franchise frequently. Let's shift gears here. Let's not talk about old school games. Let's talk about current you know Kubernetes fun stuff. Uh, and I'm going to be selfish and ask you know. Kubernetes the hard way is great. It's awesome as far as like teaching people Kubernetes internals. What is your opinion of things like OKD4 or some of the other tools that are like out of the box, these uh, like full fledged cloud native experiences or Kubernetes distributions for lack of a better term? How do you balance the, the two, right? As far as like effectiveness and teaching them versus productivity, right? Like where where do you on the Kelsey Hightower spectrum do you see both sets of skills being you know useful? I would probably say most technology in my life 
I don't know how it works a hundred percent. Right? Like I have a good idea how micro what microwaves work, but I am not really interested in studying them. I can put things in there. I don't blow up microwaves, so I, I assume I'm pretty good at it. And I think for the things that are core to me, like I work at Google Cloud and Kubernetes is a core technology for me. It had my personal interest before joining Google. So I find it necessary to understand how it actually works. Mm -hmm. But I don't expect that to be true for everyone else. I right. expect everyone else who largely looks at just consuming a Kubernetes cluster. Like when I think about the cloud, for example, we don't ask you to set up a hypervisor first before you can get your first VM. No. Right? That's, not, that's not the contract. That's not mm -mm. the expectation. No. It's just so early in the Kubernetes journey that you have the option of setting up your own cluster from scratch. Mm -hmm. I also like the idea of, of distributions. I can remember when I first got into Linux, I used to use tools like Slackware or mm -hmm. Gentoo because I wanted to earn my stripes. I wanted to be like, yo, I spent 10 days <laughs> recompiling OpenOffice before I used it. <laughs> And, and I had to add four like, modules to Linux kernel to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I think when I looked at distros, like Red Hat is where I remember I was a Red Hat certified engineer. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I'm done with this recompiling thing. Yum, install, mm. open office. Mm -hmm. I'm done with that game. So I think it's always worth as a technologist, especially when it's in your field that, of responsibility. You probably want to know how it works even if you plan to use a tool out of convenience because you're going to be responsible for ultimately troubleshooting that thing in production. Mm -hmm. So using an automation tool doesn't absolve you from the ultimate responsibility of your applications running on top of that. No, I don't disagree with that. And I think that's smart. But I think we've also hit this weird and kind of like technological advancement point of like needing uh not growth, but like feature change at a velocity that I don't think everyone can fully embrace the entire technological stack. And that's why we've got, you know, specializations. Um, so, but even something like load balancing, you know, like just look at the OSI reference model. If you learned all the IP protocols, you know, in and out, that would be a lifetime of knowledge. So it's eventually I feel I, like Kubernetes is going to get to this size where that's not going to be possible anymore. And what do we do then? I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't think it's possible now for most people. Like right. I, I, even for me, like it's just overwhelming. Like for example, I haven't gotten a chance to touch any of the window stuff. Mm -hmm. like mm. that, that's just, a, that's just a different Yeah. Like that's like a world. whole dark box to me right now. Yeah. You're right. Um, yeah. So we're already in that world and this is where we kind of rely on distributions to bring in the right components and pieces we need. So yes, I am very happy <laughs> okay. that these various tools for installing Kubernetes exist because you got to remember the way I consume Kubernetes is, these days is I click a button and the cluster comes up right. in about five minutes and then off I go. Yeah. I mean, there's value in that. I mean, but you understand like underneath the hood, right? Like if something goes wrong, how to fix it. Yeah. It's that's, there's power in that too. And I think, um, you can do both, right? Like you can have that distro out of the box and have it kind of help you along the way and learn how it's done, but make sure that you learn the things that are going to break in your application first, <laughs> the way you're using it, <laughs> and learn those things before you deploy that, and then yep. like grow as you go kind of thing. When it comes to open source in general, the thing I appreciate the most is not whether you should or you shouldn't, it's the fact that you can. Mm-hmm. If yeah. you want to learn how Kubernetes works, you can do it. You can go to GitHub. You can ask questions. You can look at the implementation. That's the real power. I think, you know, not necessarily here on the show, but in general, people tend to get very defensive about whether you should be learning these low-level details or not. But that's not how education works. Right. Education is kind of this thing that when you get the opportunity to learn and you're not prohibited from doing it, that's the power of education, and every individual has to decide what things they should spend their time getting educated on. And traditionally, the more education you have tends to work out in your favor. It's true. Um, when I think of uh, you know some of the great historians of times, they were always you know a historian and something, something, something. Like Mark Twain was all these things before he wrote all these books, kind of deal. Um, that's a very good point. But what do you see? 
you know, in that kind of sense, right? I mean, how do you see organizations like, I, I think you've mentioned this before, where you, you don't want to see people lose all their data or whatever. How do you see organizations using Kubernetes right now in a way that maybe isn't the most beneficial? And like, what is the most common one of those? <laughs> like throwing everything in Kubernetes, I know is something that we, I, I personally steer people away from doing, right? If you have stuff that works, use that as a, you know, kind of your, your true north and make sure you, you know, move new things in there first and then figure out how to get your uh, money paying things in Kubernetes or organizational importance things in Kubernetes as necessary, not like immediately kind of thing. What do you think organizations are doing wrong, like out of the gate with Kubernetes? I, what I see people doing with Kubernetes is probably not necessarily wrong. Or just not optimal. But it does, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's more about a lot of people refuse to be patient with the system like mm. a lot of people have spent like years with linux before they're able to do some of the things they're doing today and people still struggle with linux mm -hmm. when it comes to kubernetes i see enterprises say oh i heard kubernetes is working for all these other people let's just do it too and while we're at it let's refactor all of our apps into microservers mm. microservices mm -hmm. and all and while we're at that let's go ahead and bring in this prometheus thing we keep hearing about <laughs> Oh, right. while we're oh. at that, let's rub some service mesh on it. And you know what? Just for kicks, Oof. let's move that stable database right. into it as well. And now we're off to it. That's the next initiative. And you're sitting back mm -hmm. like, why would you try to take on all of that at one time when you just got done telling me that it's hard for you to adopt new technologies? It's hard for you to patch the existing systems you have. Why do you believe now that you're going to suddenly find all of this extra time, bandwidth, and skill to take on all of these things that you've never done before? Like, I encourage the fact that people are open to new ideas. That's what we need. But I think a little bit of patience and pragmatism is going to allow you to bring in those things as necessary, put them to use, finish the mission, and get them into production. Yeah, I mean, what... And it's interesting because there's all these new technologies now. Like I remember in the 90s, it was like you, you were a Microsoft shop, you were a Linux shop, maybe you were both if you were lucky. Um, but if if someone were to tell me back then, like you're going to adopt seven new technologies at once, I would laugh them out of my office or at, wherever I was working at the time because there was no way even back then like you could do that. I don't know why people think we could do it now with more stuff. Uh, it's I, I don't know why there's this high need to just embrace everything now. That's what I'm trying to figure out. I think, I don't, so, you know, just as my view, I don't really see it as more stuff because all the stuff that I see right now really rhymes with the past, right? So maybe people aren't repeating themselves by building a new version of Apache. Mm. But there's definitely some rhythm in the fact that Envoy does a lot of things that, Nginx or Apache used to do mm. with a different configuration language right. with a different assumption that everything can be API driven versus a config file. So what I'm seeing is basically technology has gotten to the, to the point where almost anyone can start remixing the things before. It's just like music, right? Mm. I remember a time where if you wanted to record an album, you would have to go to a big studio, a major production studio, get a sound engineer to make a song. Now you can go to a store, <laughs> buy equipment at your desk, mm -hmm. mix it at your desk, and upload it to something like Spotify for like less than $500. So then what you end up with is an explosion of music. And it's funny because what you'll hear sometimes is that people will recreate melodies or patterns because there's previous music that they've never heard before. Right. And they just kind of remix it in some ways, kind of by accident. And that's, I think that's what we're seeing today. Hmm. That's interesting. The, 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 the API versus the config file and how the, all the new things that are coming out are just evolutions based off the time they're created. It makes me wonder though, how long that can keep going before we've just got this, this house of cards of uh, abstraction layers. I'm hopeful that that doesn't get too flaky too fast. But yeah, yeah I mean, the same thing about music, right? There's yeah, like, oh, it's, 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 there's just it's too the, much music, right. right? So then what happens is you give the rise to the curation, mm -hmm. right? So now cur curators start to really play a prominent role in helping people make decisions. And the nice thing about that is 
you may make decisions based on sovereignty, where you're, what country you're located in. True. You may make decisions based on how compatible a thing is with your thing that you currently have. And just like in music, those platforms start to rise up and say, hey, you know, like Red Hat will say, this is the way you mm. should run Kubernetes. This we is the Red Hat remix. It. Yeah, yeah. This is the Red Hat remix. <laughs> We're going to bring in the low balancer. We're going to bring in those things. And then what you do is you start to say, you know what? I got to just trust the DJ. Yeah, you know I mean, I listen to this radio station because yeah. the DJ is going to make sure that I stay up to date on the right music. And then when I'm interested in another genre, then you may go over to another DJ that can help with that curation. Hmm. That is interesting. And I think it, Kubernetes kind of creates that, you know, standard kind of $500 DJ box set that you mentioned you can go buy at the store now and set up on your desk. As far as a standard set of APIs that people can build towards, for sure. That's interesting. But now you're going to see the creativity blow up because... We were only getting creativity from a very small set of people mm -hmm. who understood all of this stuff. But now we're saying to the average person, like, yo, you know what? You can actually start with the Kubernetes API and build any system that you can imagine. And some people are now spitting out workflow engines, various CI CD solutions, so mm -hmm. much to the point that the existing incumbents like Jenkins, right? The kind of for mm -hmm. many people is considered like the gold standard in CI CD. Now you got people building these things on top of Kubernetes, giving hints on how Jenkins should improve. And Jenkins has improved by learning what people have been doing because now people don't have to start from scratch. They can actually leverage a system like Kubernetes and mm -hmm. innovate in ways that's hard to do when you have to start from ground zero. No, oh, 100% agree, right? Like the idea of creating an API from a few lines of code is amazing to me, right? And you can just do that in Kubernetes. Um, and, you know, that to me back when I first was getting into tech, you know, like hardcore, it was, oh, everything is going to be API driven. And now it's just API out of the box kind of deal. So that's pretty fun. Um, <clears throat> The, the 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 speaking tour kind of thing that you're on right now, you want to tell people about that, like why you kind of jumped into this and why we're talking right now in general? Oh, so the backstory there for those listening, I would just, you know, every once in a while on Twitter, I like to just kind of give my thoughts and ideas about various things that are going on in a technology landscape. And a lot of times that's associated with things like Kubernetes. And I've been throwing out some ideas and concepts around configuration as data, or that the evolution of Kubernetes, if it's going to be successful, like like mobile devices or the internet, is going to have to disappear and give rise to mm -hmm. higher level platforms yeah. that people can use. And at some point, you're like, you know what? That's enough tweets. If anyone has a dope podcast, hit me up. I'll love to come on your show. And you forget that Twitter is like broadcasting you know, to the world roughly. Mm -hmm. And you end up checking my DMs and I was like, wow, there's like 20 podcasts. I've already done 10 of them. Yeah. And I got about 10 more to go. But what's been really nice about this is that each host brings something new to the conversation and I'm finding new ways to explain similar concepts with different words and different analogies that I think the variety has been really helpful for me to really crystallize these ideas in my own head. That's good to hear. the The idea of like these these complex you know systems being explained in simple phrases like that is something that I've continually struggled with, and I've always had to relate you know something someone has known with the thing I'm trying to teach to them, and and that I think is going to get harder and harder the faster we build on some of these things and those abstractions you know keep going. And to be honest with you, it was easy you know when. You know, the Windows computer was, you know, basically the first computer with the UI that was graphical kind of deal. Or that was the first OS kind of deal. Um, but now it's, you know, everything has APIs. Everything's going to have, uh, you know, containers. So I think it's it's super interesting to, like, kind of have to flavorize <laughs> the way you talk to certain people based off their experiences or what they know or uh, you know, how to explain these things. So what's like the, the coolest, you know, what's the coolest analogy you've come up with than the 10 shows you've done so far? I actually don't remember them. And I'm oh, going well, to even better about to recording. All them. Yeah. 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 yeah so I'm going to go <laughs> listen back and, and collect them because I think there's a few I use today that I think would be helpful in a written format or use in another context. And I think you also highlight something that's also important. A lot of the good analogies 
come from experience. So the more people we have with different types of experiences in the world are going to be able to produce analogies that no one else could think of. And I think that is the key to helping us all explain these complex technologies. We need more stories. And in order to get more stories, we're going to need more people. 100% agree. And that's the beauty of it. That's that's why I appreciate open source is because I remember a day when it was just X and you use that and the amount of creativity that was possible was somewhat limited. And now it's sky's the limit almost, right? Like it's what human capacity is capable of. So that's that's why I'm super hopeful for the future at the very least. So Kelsey, what uh, what other fun things are you working on? Is there any cool projects you want to shout out or where can people find you? The coolest things I think I'm working on are... You know, there's the tech side and there's this idea that we can make more and more things have this serverless feel to them, meaning they're easy to operate. The infrastructure disappears and gives way to some UI that's purpose built for the task at hand. Mm. And there's a whole collection of those things. And then there's the applied things that I'm doing in the real world mm. that I really, really enjoy a lot. For example, the latest example, uh, this weekend, my wife, she's a vice principal at the middle school my daughter goes to and this time of year is when the kids get awards for all of their achievements oh that's cool and i and i was watching how they were doing this they go to this database where all the grades are kept and they export it to a spreadsheet so now you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids and their grades mm -hmm. uh, in, in this spreadsheet and then they open up google slides and they create a kind of a base slide and then they type in the name for each child with their name, their GPA, and you know the name of the event or the semester that they're receiving this award. And I'm like, how many oh. of those are you about to do? Wow. And, mm. and it's like five or 600. And I'm like, oh. Mm. No. So then I said, you know, let's step back for a second. And I started researching the you know G Suite API. I can actually pull data from a sheet mm -hmm. and then turn those slides into a template with placeholders. Yep. And then just kind of create one on the fly. And I was like, hey, let's just do that together. So me and my wife kind of sat down and got the data right. And we wrote a few helper functions inside of the spreadsheet so we can, you know, format the kids' names correctly. Mm -hmm. And then we just built this little bit of glue code in Golang. And then we ran it. And she just watched <laughs> all of the things just get created one by one. And she was just shaking her head like, mm. And I was like, that's what technology is for. It's to automate things like that and, yeah. and in this case for a good cause right and like that's that's so much so true right like technology is, is here to help people not to like make like people's lives harder so yeah like that's kind of why i got into it in the begin with and like that right there is a perfect example i remember doing stuff like that like for my dad right when i was growing up so yeah that's cool man <laughs> Anything else cool like that going on? I mean, I need to do some G Suite automation that reminds me of a few things. Uh, I mean, there's so much going on, but, you know, I think the gist of it is that there's an opportunity all over, all mm. around you to take all of these skills that we geek out on, that we've been investing in for the years, and you can just go apply it to new and interesting problem domains outside of the little bubble that you live in. That's a great point. And with that, I think, you know, there's no better way to end the show. Thanks for coming on today, Kelsey. I really appreciate your time. I really enjoyed being here. Yeah, follow Kelsey on uh, Twitter at, at Kelsey Hightower and uh, look for him around uh, your favorite podcast on a <laughs> day near you.